Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're going to provide some summary, conclusion, statements, and remarks regarding our recent series entitled the QME Top 10. And if you've been following this series at all, uh, you realize uh, what a fascinating series it's been, and I can't believe it myself, but we're actually <laughs> here at the end of the series. This series began on January 1st, 2016 and we're now here uh, at the end of April 2016 and during that period of time we've produced uh, 26 blog posts and uh, 13 videos with over 10 hours of instruction on critical ideas, critical issues, critical principles related to the work that we do as qualified medical evaluators. And each one of the discussions in this series, 10 separate discussions, the QME Top 10, each one of these discussions has come directly from one of you uh, out there in the state of California as a qualified medical evaluator in the trenches with questions, concerns, issues, confusions, misunderstandings, barriers and roadblocks, etc that require uh, answers to. And so uh, I was thrilled to receive your input and your suggestions for discussion topics. And here we are at the end of uh, over four months of uh, hard work. And uh, if you've been following this series, uh, I hope you've learned a lot of uh, new ideas, new concepts, and new principles. I know I certainly have. Uh, it seems that uh, most of the topics that we discussed required extensive research on my end. And so uh, I've learned a tremendous amount of material uh, and a tremendous amount of knowledge, uh, gained a tremendous amount of knowledge about the workers' compensation system. And one thing I've realized with all the research that uh, I was able to put into this project is that uh, there are many recurring themes and there are many, many interrelationships of uh, ideas and topics that run through uh, the labor codes that run through the California Code of Regulations, that run through the AMA guides, that run through the 2001 Physician's Guide, and there are recurring themes in the work that we do. And I was able to see on a, from a broader perspective some of these recurring themes, and I want to share with you some of the take-home messages uh, and some of the big picture ideas from this series before we finally uh, put this series to rest. And I want you to know that every time I receive a phone call from one of you or every time I receive an email from one of you, I take notes and I try to determine, number one, what is it the question or concern that you're having? In other words, I try uh, in as much detail as possible to define the concern that you doctors are expressing and then I try and look behind and beyond the concern and deeper into the concern to find out what's the question behind the question behind the question behind the question because sometimes uh, if we have a lack of knowledge or a misunderstanding here well by the time we get removed from the original principle we're way out in left field and are uh, punting and playing in the dark, <laughs> so to speak, if you know what I mean. So, uh, I appreciate your questions and your concerns. Each one of your questions or concerns provides great material uh, for blogs and for video instructions that can benefit uh, each of us out in the field. So, I encourage you to continue uh, to respond with your questions, your concerns, uh, and really anything that uh, you'd like to discuss or like to share. Uh, similarly, if you've had a recent win, a recent victory, uh, if you've tried a new technique or a new principle and you found that it actually worked, I'd love to have you share that with me so that I can uh, share it with the rest of the profession as well. So the bottom line on that is I encourage you to keep communicating with me because your concerns uh, are my concerns, okay? Now, uh, let's uh, take this time now and uh, review 
and provide the take-home points from each of the topics of the QME Top 10. If you remember back in January, we started out with a discussion on pinch and grip strength testing. And that was our first uh, discussion. After that, we talked about examination instruments. Then we got into a discussion about apportionment, and that was uh, there was two videos associated with that discussion. We then, in part four, talked about how to improve your reports with a discussion on report writing mastery. That was also a two-part video. In part five, we talked about uh, subjective findings versus objective findings and how some qualified medical evaluators are providing for permanent impairment, even in examinees who have a completely normal physical exam. Part six, we talked about uh, the causation determination, meaning the AOE, COE determination in a denied claim. In part seven was a fascinating uh, discussion. We talked about five landmark cases that largely uh, shape the work that we do now. Namely, we talked about the Escobedo case, the Cannon case, the Sherman case, the Mili Vojevich case, and the Benson case all of which are critical to understand for the day-to-day -day, uh, reports that we write. And uh, I find of those, uh, many doctors are unfamiliar with the Benson case. So if you're not familiar with the Benson case, uh, I recommend that you obtain it and review it because the Benson analysis, the Benson analysis uh, may be required in uh, many of the cases that you evaluate it. You're simply not aware that it is required. In part eight, we talked about compensable consequence injuries. In part nine, which was a two-part series, we talked about failed treatments and why it is that so many examinees in the workers' compensation system setting uh, arrive at the permanent impairment evaluation, meaning arrive at your evaluation, uh, still complaining of sim symptoms and activities of daily living limitations. And we talked about why that could possibly be that examinees could fail treatment, could defy natural history, and could continue to uh, remain symptomatic weeks, months, and even years after the industrial injury. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, last week in part 10, we talked about post-termination claims. Post-termination claims and how to handle post-termination claims, and what is the role of you as the qualified medical evaluator in those cases where a claim for industrial injury is filed at a time after the examinee has been terminated from their employment, the so-called post-termination claims. So I want to summarize and synopsize uh, very briefly just a couple key points from each one of those 10 discussions to let you know uh, what I consider to be the most important, uh, don't forget, always remember points from our 10-part series. So uh, I look forward to being back with you here in just a couple moments as we bring the finishing touches to the conclusion of our ongoing program, uh, the QME Top 10. here regarding and relating to uh, this latest series, the QME Top 10, and uh, look at the number of pages involved uh, in these 10-part discussions. It's really been uh, quite a fascinating and thrilling project for me to be able to bring this to you because of all the different sources and types of research uh, that went into uh, these discussions. So now let's briefly uh, review the salient take-home points, the take-home points uh, from each of our 10 discussions. And very briefly, you remember in part one of this series, we talked about pinch and grip strength testing. Now, did you know 
And did you remember from that discussion that I said that tables 1631, 1632, and 1633, which are the tables in the AMA guides that we use to uh, describe the normal, normal grip and pinch strength values. Did you know those tables are based on a study that was published in 1970? <laughs> this video is being recorded in 2016 and the values that we're using to provide for permanent impairment for today's examinees are based on studies that were published in 1970. Now, let me ask you, what's changed since 1970? <laughs> Basically everything. And uh, my uh, position and my opinion is that these tables are no longer valid and that they provide for artificially inflated permanent impairment ratings for your examinees. So they're invalid for one thing. The second thing is that examinees rarely, rarely give you a full cooperative effort on grip strength testing. The only time an examinee gives you a true full and cooperative effort is when they're attempting to show you how strong they are. When they're trying to show you how weak they are, you can count on their effort not being a valid or reliable effort. So for those reasons, uh, in my opinion, pinch and grip strength testing basically has no value and no use in the permanent impairment evaluation. And for that reason, you can confidently go ahead and sell your JMAR dynamometer. <laughs> in part two, we talked about uh, examination instruments. Examination instruments. And the philosophy behind uh, the selection of your examination instruments <clears throat> traces to the Escobedo case. The Escobedo case uh, informed us that in order for our opinions and conclusions to qualify as substantial medical evidence, our opinions and conclusions have to be based, among other things, on an adequate exam. Escobedo specifically described an adequate exam. Well, what qualifies as an adequate exam? Well, in this discussion, we stated that an adequate exam is an examination that exactly follows the procedures as described in the AMA guides and uses the exact exam instruments that are described in the AMA guides. Now, some doctors use examination instruments that they have handy around in their clinical practice that aren't described in the AMA guides but it's my opinion that that does not constitute an adequate exam for the type of work that we're doing in California workers' compensation. Your examination procedures and your examination instruments must, must, must exactly <laughs> comply with the descriptions in the AMA guides. So make sure to get every single examination instrument that's described in the AMA guides and replace your clinical practice exam instruments with those other instruments. <clears throat> in part three of this discussion, uh, we talked about apportionment and we approached apportionment uh, from a couple of different angles. It was fascinating. We spent uh, one whole video talking about labor codes 4663 and 4664. 4663 tells us that we're obligated, we're obligated, in those cases that result in permanent impairment, we're obligated to provide approximate percentages of the permanent impairment due to the industrial injury and approximate percentages of the permanent impairment due to other factors. So our percentages can be approximate. In other words, there's no real way to provide for exact percentages. How could you ever do that? You can't. So the law allows us to provide approximate percentages. So you can be approximate. You don't have to be exact. But whatever percentages of permanent impairment you do provide for, you're not going to get beat up by the parties as to why did you say 50% and not say 48%. They're not going to pinch us on exact point, points of percentage. Where they 
will pinch us is if we don't properly support our opinion and conclusion for the percentages. So while the percentages don't need to be exact, your reasons and conclusions in support of those percentages uh, need to be exacting and they need to be good. Now, Labor Code 4664 tells us that if an examinee has a prior award of permanent disability, then that award exists forever into perpetuity, including the time at which the examinee suffers a subsequent industrial injury. So if you have an examinee who has a prior permanent disability award for their lumbar spine, and then 10 years later they have another injury to the lumbar spine, we know, at least according to the law on administrative basis, that at the time of that second injury, the lumbar spine was already bad. It was already a bad back. So when the examinee comes to you and tells you that they have all these symptoms with the lower back, it's no surprise because they already had a bad back. The law demands it. The law demands that we consider it such. Okay? Then, uh, in the second part of our apportionment discussion, we talked about how to determine your percentages. And that seems to be a big question for many doctors. They say, how do I determine the percentage of permanent impairment due to the injury? How do I determine the percentage of permanent impairment that's due to other factors? How do I do that? How do I arrive at numbers that make sense? <laughs> Good question. Well, it was a confusion for me until I discovered uh, what is known as the mechanism of injury continuum. The mechanism of injury continuum. And I want you to start focusing in on your uh, history taking with your examinees, focusing in on discovering and defining and characterizing the mechanism of injury. Now, mechanism of injuries can be classified as mild injuries, moderate injuries or severe injuries, and the apportionment percentages will differ based upon the type of injury that the examinee suffered. The milder injuries are going to result in a larger percentage of the permanent impairment being due to other factors and a small percentage being due to the industrial injury, whereas a severe mechanism of injury will, will result in a higher percentage of permanent impairment due to the industrial injury and a lower percentage being due to other factors. A fascinating concept. Okay, and then in part four of this discussion, uh, we talked about report writing mastery. How to clarify, number one, your thinking, first of all. Number two, how to clarify your writing. And number three, how to present your opinions and conclusions in a way such that the reader of your report can logically follow your reasoning. And so many doctors' reports are unclear. Uh, they're circuitous. They're confusing. They're not clear. And the best way to present clear conclusions and clear opinions is to begin with clear thinking. Clear thinking. And so I provided some tools for you known as the topic headline formats to allow you to organize your opinions and conclusions in such a way that you present your information exactly the way that it's described in the Escobedo case, which refers to opinions and conclusions being based on pertinent facts, pertinent facts. So we talked about what qualifies as pertinent facts. When you have a causation opinion, what are the pertinent facts upon which your opinion should be based? When you talk about permanent impairment, what are the pertinent facts upon which you base your opinion? When you talk about the apportionment of the permanent impairment, what are the pertinent facts upon which you rely? It's all about presenting your pertinent facts in a way in your report that the reader of your report sees your opinions and conclusions basically as 
accurate and as irrefutable, irrefutable. And that's exactly how we want to present our reports, such that our opinions and conclusions are irrefutable. Why are they irrefutable? They're irrefutable because they're based on so many facts. <laughs> and I showed you how to organize your facts. That was a fascinating discussion. And I encourage you to do that with every opinion and conclusion that you render. When you render an opinion or conclusion in your report and you provide your supporting facts for that opinion or conclusion, Review those facts. Review them. Take a look at them as an objective third party would and ask yourself, how convincing are those facts? How compelling are those facts? How irrefutable are those facts? If they're not convincing, if they're not compelling, if they're not irrefutable, work on them until they are. Change them or change your opinion to something upon which you have more facts. Okay? And that's basically how we decide in these tough cases. How do we decide? We go with the opinion that has the most supportive facts. Okay? In part five, we had a fascinating discussion. We talked about the difference between subjective findings or subjective complaints by the examinee and the objective findings on our physical exam. And we talked about how the AMA guides and number one and then the Almarez Guzman II decision uh, provide us as doctors tremendous latitude, tremendous freedom, and tremendous liberty in fashioning our opinions and conclusion. And as an example of that, I described a case uh, known as the Cannon versus City of Sacramento case, wherein the agreed medical evaluator provided for a very, very generous permanent impairment rating on the basis of a completely normal completely normal physical exam. It would be like me or you going into the QME examination having a normal exam and getting a generous permanent impairment rating for that. And I showed you how that was done and how you can do that if it's your opinion that that's a true representation uh, of your examinee. In part six, we talked about uh, the causation determination, the AOE-COE determination in a denied claim, in a denied claim. So I encourage you to start recognizing your claims or your cases for what they are. Many of the cases that you're getting and being called upon to evaluate are claims that have been denied, claims that have been denied. You'll know you're working on a case that's been denied when your evaluation falls reasonably close to the date of injury, say within 90 to 120 to 150 days. These are claims that are denied under Labor Code 5402, also known as the $10,000 rule, and you get the evaluation under Labor Code 4060, which is defined as the compensability exam. You're being called upon to determine the compensability of the claim. So this specific type of evaluation is a unique cat. It's unique all unto itself, and the role of the QME evaluator in this type of evaluation is different than your role in a evaluation under Labor Code 4061, or Labor Code 4062, where you're determining other issues. In this type of exam, your determination involves compensability. Is there a claim or is there not a claim? And the role of the evaluator in this situation is different and unique. And we described it in great detail in this discussion. Also, uh, we provided a causation algorithm, and I gave you some great uh, thinking tools to help you in your decision-making process. Probably the greatest of all the tools that I provided you was the his history question, the interview question with your examinee. When they describe the mechanism of injury, the history question involves asking them, was this a witnessed incident or was it an unwitnessed incident? And we took the algorithm from there. We began with, is it a witnessed incident? Yes or no? And we took the algorithm from there. 
So always make the witnessed and unwitnessed question the very first question that you ask uh, in your interviewing of the examinee. In part seven, we talked about uh, five landmark cases uh, that shape the work that we do, including the Escobedo case, the Cannon case, the Sherman case, the Millie Vojovic case, and the Benson case. And I described each of those uh, in great detail. For our purposes, uh, they're all important. Uh, I recommend that you be fluent, fluent with the Escobedo case and the Benson case. And particularly with the Escobedo case, because it comes up so much in so many parts of the work that we do. The Benson analysis really uh, refers specifically to our permanent impairment determination. So that's a more isolated type of application of that case. But the Escobedo case has broad application uh, really throughout our report, throughout our physical exam, and it dictates many of the procedures uh, that we do. And if you follow the dictates of the Benson uh, decision, uh, your physical exam will be greatly improved, your reporting will be greatly improved, your decision making will be greatly improved, and your opinions and conclusions uh, will be infinitely stronger uh, than they currently are. And you'll end up providing opinions and conclusions that, like I said earlier, basically are irrefutable. If you follow the exact recipe described in the Escobedo case, by the time you finally get to your opinions and conclusions and put the signature on the report, the report will be basically irrefutable because there's nothing, there's nothing there to be refuted. You've already gone through the possible questions and the possible uh, weak spots in your report in advance by applying the Escobedo recipe to your report. So I recommend that you be fluent with at least the Escobedo case and then also uh, with the Benson case. In part eight, we talked about compensable consequence injuries. <laughs> that was a great, that was a great discussion. And we agreed that most claims for compensable consequence injuries uh, are not injuries at all. They're not injuries. They don't rise to the level of a bona fide diagnosable condition. Compensable consequence injuries are really mostly just symptoms that are associated with the original condition. And because they are symptoms associated with the original condition, they don't require any specific treatment in and of themselves and they don't qualify for an elevated or increased permanent impairment rating unless there's some other <clears throat> extenuating circumstance. And these symptoms simply are part of the original condition. And we recognize this as qualified medical evaluators, we recognize these symptoms as being part of the original condition. And the AMA guides tell us that <clears throat> All of the permanent impairment ratings that are given in the guides consider both the local pain and the distant pain associated with the condition. So for example, for cervical radiculopathy, we don't provide for extra impairment due to pain in the extremity or weakness in the extremity. We recognize that as part and parcel of the syndrome of radiculopathy. Many of the compensable consequence symptoms that examinees report are simply part and parcel of the original condition. So in that sense, they don't qualify for medical treatment, they don't qualify for increased permanent impairment ratings. In part nine, we talked about failed treatments and this was a two-part video series. In this series, which was fascinating, I raised the question to you as qualified medical evaluators, I raised the question, how many of your examinees, how many of your examinees are you rendering a permanent impairment rating for? My suspicion is that a large number, a large percentage of your examinees are getting a permanent impairment rating from you. Probably very few of your examinees are you rendering a 0% permanent impairment rating. Very few of your examinees are getting a stamp of healed, cured, 
return to pre-injury status, um, <clears throat> uh, labeling from you. You're giving permanent impairment ratings. Well, that raises the question, well, why? Why are these examinees failing to return to pre-injury status? Why are they failing to recover to pre-injury level of symptoms, pre-injury level of function? Why? Most of the examinees are getting plenty of adequate treatment. <clears throat> They're given ample opportunity for the healing benefit of time. They're being given modified duties, total temporary disability. They're being taken away from the injurious, injurious environment. And yet, they come to the permanent impairment evaluation 12 months later, 18 months later, 24 months later, still with problems. <laughs> How can that be? How can that be? Well, the reason that is has to do a lot with malingering <clears throat> and what the DSM-4 refers to as a lack of cooperation with the treatment program. And examinees in the workers' compensation system will fail to cooperate with the treatment program, they'll fail to cooperate with diagnostic studies, and they'll fail to cooperate with your evaluation because examinees in the workers' compensation, a large percentage of them, and I'm not saying every single one of them, I'm saying a large percentage of them have no intention of admitting that they're completely well because they have every intention of receiving compensation for permanent residua from the industrial injury. And we talked about that at great length. And we talked about how to identify and spot the ways and the points at which examinees can confound the treatment process. They can confound the diagnostic studies, ways in which and points at which they can confound your qualified medical evaluation. And then finally, in our last discussion, uh, we talked about post-termination claims. Now, post-termination claims are uh, governed under Labor Code 3600. And it tells us that unless very specific circumstances can be met, most claims that are filed, po uh, filed post-termination simply do not fly because we recognize those as simply attempts of the examinee to retaliate towards the employer. So this is so well known that it's written into the law. It's called Labor Code 3600. It says no compensation shall be paid in these cases where the claim is filed post-termination. But still, sometimes we get these cases. Why would we get these cases if the claim has been denied under Labor Code 3600? Well, sometimes the parties still want a medical determination, even though the claim has been denied on an administrative slash legal basis. They sometimes still seek an, a medical determination to uh, find out what is the examinee's condition, does he have a bona fide condition, and is it possible that the bona fide condition, if it exists, is it possible that that could have been caused by an industrial injury the way that the examinee described it to have occurred. So this is a lot like the causation in a denied claim scenario that we talked about a little bit earlier because these represent a subset of the denied claims. Of all the claims that are denied, post-termination claims are a small subset of those denied claims and it requires a very specific and a very uh, precise handling by us as the qualified medical evaluators. And we talked about that in great detail. So, woo! <laughs> what a wide range of topics and what a different approach uh, to the different types of concerns that doctors are expressing out there uh, in the trenches as we speak. Each one of these discussions uh, is current up and to the minute. So uh, each one of these reflects current concerns that we're all having uh, in our examination of injured workers and in producing our qualified medical evaluation reports. So doctors, I uh, hope you found a great benefit out of this program. It's been my pleasure to bring it to you. Uh, I look forward to uh, bringing you more programs and more series in the future. 
And uh, for now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'm wishing you uh, best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.